Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, really happy to be here. Um, how are you guys doing? Are you, can you guys hear me well? Yes. All right. All right. So let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about how to um, you know, be a painter uh, without not knowing much about painting. And let's see, uh, at the end of the talk, my goal is that uh, you guys have a little bit of idea how to go back home and try it yourself and experiment with it. So before we get into the details, uh, just to briefly introduce myself again, my name is uh, Pramit Chaudhary. Uh, these are the, you know, the social media uh, handles that you can reach out to me. Uh, I'm a lead data scientist at datascience.com. Um, most recently, I've been uh, focusing on how to, um, you know, the, the, basically the effective ways of optimizing and evaluating machine learning algorithms. Um, it, modern interpretation is another example of it. I, I'll talk about that also uh, in a bit. But the whole idea is that how can we make uh, machine learning get applied to, um, to solve uh, real world problems in a more effective manner. So today's talk, the agenda uh, will be to make sure everybody's on the same page. We're gonna be uh, doing a recap on the analytical workflow. Um, we'll briefly make sure, I'll make sure that everybody's on the same page with respect to convolutional, convolutional neural networks because I'm guessing not everybody does deep learning or image segmentation or classification on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, introduce uh, TensorFlow, uh, not sure if everybody knows about Livy and Spark Magic. So these are some recent projects that have come along, quite interesting. Uh, briefly explain the uh, style transfer algorithm. Um, and then how, uh, you know, a small experiment that I did to scale the, uh, the parameter tuning for uh, style, uh, style transfer algorithm using uh, Spark and TensorFlow. And then towards the end, uh, we'll get to the Q&A. So, let's see if I can point. Oh, okay. So, um, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with the, um, you know, the typical analytical workflow, right? So we start with first um, defining some hypothesis of a use case that we are trying to solve. Um, then we handle the data, uh, which means we transform the data, do some ETL operation on it. And then the other aspect of it is engineering and then feature selection. Then we build a model. If we want to operationalize this, we deploy it in some form. And then we get to the aspect of testing and monitoring. Um, I have two other uh, boxes on the top, but for today's topic, not be focusing on that, but that's more related to how do we effectively evaluate and interpret models. So for today's topic, since we're talking about deep learning, the most important aspect when we look at deep learning is that we don't want to create these features with hands. Um, this becomes more, makes more sense in case when we are handling text and images because the amount of feature that we could think of is just exponential, there is no end to it. And then the other problem is the, uh, a lot of causal relation that is there across uh, different feature sets, a um, lot of nonlinear relationship, which we may or may not have domain knowledge about it to formulate it ourselves. So we look, for, look towards deep learning that, okay, can we have a box where we give this huge feature set and it determines, somehow it determines what those nonlinear relationships are and gives us a, a, a result which is satisfactory. Um, so that's why I've kind of uh, marked it as green here because that's what we'll be focusing in today's talk. So before we get to the topic, uh, the universe is changing, right? Um, deep learning is becoming more and more prominent into um, uh, real life use cases. So I'm sure everybody kind of knows that the whole algorithm or the basic algorithm has been around since 1950s, if I recall correctly. And if you go and check back the, like, you know, the history graph of deep learning, it's a sinusoidal curve. And there is always like a peak because there's a huge demand and people realize, oh, can't, they can't make it work effectively. Then it goes down and then there's like, you know, it's a, it's a curve. So now we're in this phase where we are on the peak again because now it seems people are able to apply it to solve real world problems. And why that is happening is because the amount of data that we are collecting is, is increased. More heterogeneous devices are interconnected, which means they're generating more and more data, which is very useful for deriving this nonlinear relationship, hence solving um, the real world problem in an effective manner. And the other one is that people are getting, like, you know, just uh, 
um, the, the manual feature creation is getting really tiresome. There is more than one use case to solve at one point in time. And so we're looking to systems which could help us automate this, uh, this aspect of uh, machine learning or predictive modeling. And then the most important aspect is the computation resources getting cheaper. So like, you know, five years back, maybe if we had access to a GPU box, it was like, oh great, like, you know, we have access to a GPU box. But now um, CPUs, uh, the RAMs are getting cheaper. Like, you know, uh, it's very easy to get access to like huge clusters, uh, becoming easier to get access to GPU clusters. So things are, Things are becoming more, like uh, the, the resources are uh, much easily available for us to experiment and derive uh, or make deep learning models work. So with that, let's quickly define what we mean by deep learning. So deep learning is an um, artificial neural network. It's a subset of that. Uh, basically, we say deep because it's more than two layers that is part of the neural network that is being created. Um, we define hierarchy, hierarchy, of, hierarchy of multiple layers for nonlinear processing uh, unit for feature extraction and transformation. Um, basically, it's a collection of simple, trainable mathematical functions. So, there, so this nonlinear relationship that we are trying to articulate or capture is basically derived out of simple linear equations, which are overlapped in multiple different ways to understand what other latent interaction is there. Um, that we, 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 we as humans are not able to uh, capture. And, uh, uh, and then like, uh, as we mentioned in the last slide, the, the adoption is, uh, is, ex is continuously or exponentially accelerated, uh, especially around uh, image understanding, uh, self-driving vehicles and, and more. So um, I just added a cat image because I wanted my talk to be popular, but. Um, <laughs> so as you can see, uh, like you know, this image we have like you know more than one layer, and that's what it is. All those transformations are a bunch of linear transformations which are overlapped across multiple layers. So as a concept, that's what deep learning is mostly about. Uh, now, if we forget about any algorithm, uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to data, all that we are trying to do is if and else, right? It's all rule-based approach. What we're trying to capture with this if and else is basically some patterns. Now, let's take a step back and think that if it's an image, how many if and else do, will we have to actually write to actually capture any pattern out in, 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 in that image? Say we're trying to identify a cat or a dog. So let's do a small experiment and uh, let's see if we can make it interactive. Um, what we're trying to do here is what if we have a pattern which is like a, a cross or an X and say the computer is able to understand that, that particular pattern of visual representation in some uh, numerical format. So minus one, one is how I'm representing it here. So if you could see the boxes which are colored in blue and uh, marked as minus one is the, uh, you know, the, the this diagonal and the other one is the forward diagonal, the backward and the forward diagonal, right? So let's see if uh, we can do something to identify this pattern. So I have some images here. So um, in order to do this, are, are we familiar with the concept of like a sliding window? Can I see some raise of hands? Cool, perfect. So we're gonna do something similar and see how this get maps to, gets mapped to a convolutional network. So in the previous slide, we had defined a pattern with this uh, representation. Now let's see if we can do some sliding window on this. So that window which is I've created marked in green with some plus and minuses, that say, assume that's a sliding window that we have defined, which is two by two matrix, because at the end of the day, we're dealing with pixels. So there would be some matrix transformation and uh, computation that we have to take care of. And let's, if we keep sliding that window, what we're trying to capture is to learn uh, some patterns through this sliding window. So what do I mean by that? So now, uh, if, if you look on the, the top left corner, uh, when we slide this window, let's assume that we had defined some uh, uh, transformation rule. In this case, what we're saying is that this sliding window has plus, minus, minus, plus matrix defined, and each time it sees a value, it gonna, uh, it's gonna uh, multiply that value 
with the uh, um, uh, with with one, and if it's a minus one, then it's going to multiply it with minus one, and then we sum all the values together to get some numerical value out of it, and then what we can do is we can set a threshold uh, and say that if it is greater than zero, it's a like you know it's some sort of a diagonal, and the uh, pattern that I want to learn should be as how the matrix uh, the matrix you know turns up. So like in this case. We see that you know for the backward diagonal we have four and uh, uh, four and four diagonally opposite each other in some form. Then if we apply the same one with a different uh, filter that is minus plus plus minus, if you see I've just transposed the the signs there, then I can just reverse it and mirror it as a as a forward diagonal. So now what I've done is just just by defining a simple filter, what I've tried to capture is that. I'm trying to identify some pattern from the image. So now that's this filter is typically called what what uh, how we define convolution as. So that's what we say like you know convolution layer is typically that's what it is doing. Now uh, I, uh, the activation function is some you know some threshold function that we have kind of defined based on which it will activate some neurons and it will uh, you know, deactivate some neurons. So basically, uh, it, in this case, it will highlight. Four and uh, four uh, and not minus four because say so we have set a threshold on greater than zero, and with that what we've done is we have identified the pattern that we're looking for, and towards the end so there's something else called as po polling layer, and polling layer is basically as uh, subsampling because we are dealing with millions of uh, pixel uh, data points, so it's computationally very expensive. So there may be some way where we can shrink the size of the image so that we can start focusing on some certain aspects of the image. So I just mentioned about convolutional layer, which is basically just think in terms of a filter that we're going to define and sliding window. So we keep moving it. It could be one pixel, two pixel, two pixel or three pixel uh, as to how we want to uh, make the window move. Um, then we define an activation function and then we also defined a, a, a polling layer. Towards the end, what we do is we say it's a fully connected layer, so then we connect all the neurons together, take all the weights that has been associated with each other, and superimpose the different learning, um, um, different learning layers, and then we get the final image. So what we have done is, we started with our simple use case, and we applied a filter, and we have identified uh, our pattern here. So with that, let's define what a convolution neural network is. So convolution neural network is a type of feed-forward artificial neural network, so it moves in the forward direction. That's what uh, it means with respect to feed-forward, so there is no um, uh, back cycle which is there. Uh, we can set a, a back propagation, but typically when we think of a convolution neural network, we are thinking in terms of feed-forward. So it's always moving in a forward direction. And there have been proven very successful with respect to uh, pattern recognition, with respect to images. Um, there are three key properties when it comes to convolution neural network. One is the spatial arrangement. So what happens is that um, in each layer we define neurons, so we have to kind of define some, uh, some sort of a dimension to capture this, uh, the image representation as a matrix. So we define that matrix as height, uh, width, height, and depth. Depth is to capture the different color channels. Uh, in simple terms, if we think of three, then it's this RGB, so red, uh, green, and blue. And they could be multi, uh, like you know, they could be more than three channels, or depending on as to how many, what's the depth that we want to cover. And this depth is one of the uh, hyperparameters that we can tweak on to get more and more uh, refined images or, or better classifications. Then uh, there's something called as local connectivity. So what happens is that if you see the red box there, this, uh, we have the, huge, the big red box and then a smaller one. So that is, so that is, like, so, um, that is one neuron which is uh, capturing a certain aspect of the image and that is being transformed to a set of values. And all those values, um, they are, uh, so, so they are sensitive only to that specific location. Uh, small region, and all of those, uh, the neurons in that block, so uh, let, me, let me put it this way, the filter that we had defined earlier, the green box, that is like one neuron, 
uh, that we are, the small region that we are talking about. And that small box will have the same weight for all the, uh, all the values in, 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 that, in that box. So that's what we mean by the shared weight. So all the neurons for a given convolutional layer will respond to the same feature weights. And then uh, that's, you know, the, the rest of the, uh, um, the diagram is just showing an activation function, uh, which, which there are like multiple different activation functions uh, which are defined. Simple ones could be like sigmoid um, and tanish, and then there are like multiple others. So with that, uh, let's take a brief look into how uh, a convolutional, uh, convolutional neural network architecture typically, typically looks like. So if we have an image, um, that's we can define our, um, so it's an image of a robot here, and we define this green box as a small filter. We filter across the whole image. We keep sliding the window or the filter across the whole image. We capture certain values. So what it is doing, it's capturing certain aspects of the of the image and what uh, and transforms into multiple layers of feature maps. Uh, these feature maps uh, that we start like uh, we keep increasing the depth of this filter. So uh, uh, and with uh, pooling, which is basically subsampling, we keep reducing the size of the image that we're looking at. So uh, what happens is that as we move from higher to a lower layer, higher layers will have uh, it will have like the um, the true representation of the whole image, and as we start moving towards the lower layers, it will be start. It will start to focus on more specific elements of the of a particular image. Um, I have a, a better slide that I can um, walk you guys through. So, with that, let's take a, a so like you know a change of topic. So, let's talk a little bit about TensorFlow. So, we all know it's uh, great for deep learning. Obviously, released by Google. Um, can be used for general purpose numerical computation. Uh, the core is written in C++, which helps in faster computation, especially, especially with respect to matrix multiplication. It has front, uh, front ends in uh, Python and C++, which makes it easier for a lot of us to quickly experiment and play around with it. So um, in this slide, what I've done is, just uh, you know, try to capture a very simple numeric computation using TensorFlow. So in this, what all I'm trying to do is just multiply two numeric values and then get an output. Um, one thing that you guys would know is that I'm statically mentioning the type of the variables that, uh, that I'm asking the TensorFlow to take in and do the multiplication, uh, which helps in faster computation. And this graph that I'm trying to show here is basically articulating the fact that in the TensorFlow world, everything is uh, a data flow graph. So we deal with uh, all numerical computations as some uh, as a graph data flow. Uh, they, yeah. So now uh, let's do another change of topic uh, and talk about Livy and Spark Magic. So uh, as the um, the whole uh, space around Spark has become so popular uh, that maintaining uh, clusters is becoming really difficult, um, especially like you know in an enterprise dev environment, people have to constantly change their cluster uh, uh, type, and you know maybe today it's clouded or tomorrow it's hot and works. Uh, um, uh, a month later, maybe it's MapR and so on and so forth, and it's becoming really difficult for uh, for enterprises to maintain their uh, their environment. So, recently, uh, there's a project called Livy which which got open sourced, and basically what it does is it allows us to connect to Spark clusters using a REST interface. So basically, what we're doing now is instead of connecting manually to a Spark cluster, we have a REST interface where we can define some functions and uh, inv invoke some webhooks to, to a Spark cluster, and then we can launch our jobs. Um, there are some other cool features around it. We can have multiple Spark contexts. We can share the RDDs or the data frames that we are creating across multiple jobs and clients. Um, have, uh, is everyone in the room has got a chance to play around with Spark or is familiar when I say what, what is an RDD or a data frame? 
Okay, so for the others, um, RDDs and data frames, you can think of it as a NumPy array or a Pandas data frame. I'm, uh, are people familiar with that? Sure. So think of it like a Pandas data frame and has there's some um, object uh, structure that is defined to it that it can distribute not with respect to a, a single box, but it could distribute uh, across multiple boxes. And it has other capabilities that if the transformation does not go through, uh, then you know it's going to uh, uh, give you uh, error results. So it, it is fault tolerant. So it will it's very it, like you know it's responsible in that way. So if you are uh, doing some computation across multiple um, multiple nodes, if it, the transformation does not go through, then it's going to give uh, an error response back or try to figure out if it can restart the whole transformation again. This becomes really useful if you're doing or handling huge amounts of data. Uh, so that's what I uh, mean by the RDD uh, and data frames. The data frame is just a new format for RDD. And um, they also, so through the, through the Livy um, um, REST interface, one could also submit jars, which are pre-compiled uh, pre jars, uh, snippets of code. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it is Java, Scala, um, and through a client API. And Spark Magic is that client API. So Spark Magic is a Jupyter kernel. Uh, which allows one to, so you see this diagram, so when I mentioned client, so that Spark Magic, think of it as a, as a kernel for now, through which uh, we will connect to a REST interface, which is the REST server, there is the Levy server, which will help us in launching jobs into the cluster. And what I show here is a typical environment for a Spark cluster, where the concept is that we have a master node and a multiple worker nodes. So this is what I was uh, coming to. So Spark Magic is a simple Jupyter kernel, through which what we do is we uh, make a call to the Livy server through a REST interface. This is the job x is equal to y is equal to x1 plus x2. Ask Livy to uh, take that job and make a query to the Spark cluster, run the job, get the result, and push the result back to the uh, to the client kernel. Uh, in form of a text or a JSON, as a JSON or a text format. Cool. All right, so we are, we're done with all the boring stuff, now the cool part. Um, so now let's start to paint, right? So what are we exactly doing? So uh, in style transfer, it's a, it's a fairly simple algorithm that is there in place. What we do is we take an input image, we take a style image, we extract the contents, from the input image, we extract the contents from the style image, and we figure out a way of merging the two contents together, superimposing, and then we create a new image. Now the key, uh, or the most difficult part, is, uh, is controlling that merging aspect. And the other aspect is the different features that we are extracting from, uh, from the content and from the style. So from the content, what we do is we extract um, we extract the, um, uh, whether it's the, I think uh, if I remember, so we extract the uh, lower level feature. So what we want to capture is just the true representation of the image. We don't want the exact pixel representation of it because we want to change it. But with style, we want the exact pixel representation because we want to superimpose that representation on top of the actual image to generate a new image. So on the surface at a high level, that's what there is to the algorithm. Uh, and how do we do it? So with that, let me introduce uh, something called as uh, VGG19. Uh, has anyone heard of it? Cool. So you guys know that uh, it got created out of uh, the ImageNet challenge that was there, I think, back in 2014. Uh, and Karen and Andrew were the people uh, who designed this VG19. Um, that it's, uh, you know, it's trained over a million images to classify 1,000 objects, so it's like a rich data set, and typically it can detect almost all uh, forms of uh, common objects that we could think of, and it's very powerful. So that's what I mean by capable of recognizing feature representations of wide range of images. Uh, why is it 19? So it's com it is composed of 16, so we're talking about deep uh, neural networks, so obviously a lot of layers, so it has 16 convolutional layers, so it has 16 different filters. Um, it has uh, five uh, 
So I mentioned that max pooling. So this pooling, when we are trying to downsample, downsampling could be done in different ways. We could think of it like if we have a set of values and one wants to, uh, and one is given a task that give me one value. If I give you five values, just return me one. Now that one value could be an average of those five values. It could be a max of those five values. Uh, it could be minimum. Uh, typically for pooling, people use max and average. And towards the end, we have uh, three fully connected layers. So we're talking about a convolutional layer. So it's like um, from each uh, f um, uh, layer, we, we take all the, um, the weights and we, tra uh, we transform it to the next layer or pass it on to the next layer. So we have three fully connected layers so that we get like a very good um, uh, image representation towards the end. So this is uh, how VGG19 representation typically looks like. So as you can see, we have uh, con like you know those numbers that are mentioned there. Those are the different convolutional filters that uh, that is uh, created as a part of VGG19. So basically, it's a pre-compiled, um, a pre-trained um, image image recognition model that we're going to be using uh, for extracting uh, different aspects of the input and the style image. So I was mentioning that um, when we are at the um, the, lower, uh, the, the, the lower layers, that is when we are starting it, it starting with the um, extraction of the image. So we are at depth 64. And as you see that, you know, as we go further down, the depth is increasing. So when the depth is increasing, it is starting to focus on the, um, the it is starting to focus on the, the, uh, the actual uh, structure of the image and it's starting to forget about the exact pixel values. So, so, so for example, if, uh, if I were to give um, you know, this room, it's just going to re uh, remember like, the, the basic structure of it and start forgetting about like, you know, whether the walls are painted in gray uh, and so on. So what, how, how it becomes helpful is that when we use, um, so then we use uh, the lower layers on the style input to extract the, uh, the final, uh, so we use the, the higher layers to extract the style input, uh, the pixel values from the style input so that we could get the pixel representation of the, of the image. Uh, I've shown you uh, like, you know, a small snippet of code that we could typically use to, uh, uh, you know, you guys can uh, try it at home and see what these layers look like. So with that, let's start to paint, right? So what I did is I took a sketch of the Space Needle. Um, this is a, a famous painting as a style input. And I and tried to apply it um, using the style transfer algorithm and see if I if I am able to control the final image that I'm trying to get. So what I show those three images that are there are intermediate transformation steps. So as you can see that the one on the on the uh, on the left is is a little. It's not clear what it is uh, what the final image is going to be because it's in the process of superimposing uh, the images. And as we move along towards the end, we see that oh, okay, so we have generated some some cool image uh, towards the end. So uh, one more uh, quick thing. So since we are doing uh, machine learning, there needs to be some. Um, cost function or a loss function that we are trying to optimize on. So as we are superimposing these different images, uh, there, what is that loss function that we are trying to optimize on and how do we control the different weights on it so that we have a control on the image that is getting, getting generated? So as mentioned earlier, we are using an input image uh, using a pre-trained VGG19 model to extract, in this case for an input image, we use the lower layers to extract the true representation because just we, just, we just want the spatial structure representation of the image. And for the input image, we want the exact pixel values, so we use the, lower, uh, the higher layers, uh, as you can see. And then we uh, combine the two together. So there is a little, um, so what I've left out is uh, uh, there's a small uh, matrix uh, computation that is happening underneath. But towards the end, all that we are trying to optimize on is the loss in the uh, image content, loss in the style content, and some, there's something called as total variational uh, denoising. This is basically um, to, um, uh, to, to capture the aspect that if an image moves a certain distance, we're still able to capture the, you know, the, the, the true representation of an, of an image. 
Um, but the, more, the most important aspect is the alpha and beta, and that is the weight related to content and the weight related to style. And as we keep experimenting on that, we'll see that we keep generating different images. So, um, so we talked about, so we have covered a lot of uh, different topics, right? We started with uh, defining convolutional layer, then we jumped uh, some slides, we talked about TensorFlow, we talked about Spark, uh, we talked about Livy, and we talked about Spark Magic. So how can we combine all of this together, and how is Spark and uh, TensorFlow helping, or will help us in any way? So uh, most of the deep learning computation, we think of it as like a single powerful box where we uh, you know, uh, deploy an algorithm, maybe probably use a GPU, and it computes the result. Um, but as we know that still getting access to the GPU uh, clusters may not be that easily possible. Um, or even if it is, uh, it's very, so the single most important thing in, uh, or the, I would say the second most important thing in, um, in training predictive or machine learning models is hyperparameter tuning. The first one being feature engineering and selection, right? So we try to solve that using deep learning, some automated uh, feature uh, learning and selection that is happening, but we are still left with the problem that we have to control the other parameters that are associated with respect to deep learning. Let's say uh, is the depth. In this case, is the alpha and beta, that is the content weight and the style weight. Uh, there are other aspects to it that we might have to control. So how can we um, start tuning a lot of this, uh, start building a lot of these models in parallel? Um, so that's what I mean by, um, that's where Spark could really be useful for um, uh, you know, um, building or doing um, hyperparameter tuning in parallel. And this is embarrassingly uh, parallel because there is no um, iterative operation which is, uh, which is happening when we do parameter tuning, iterative in a way that there is, isn't any input that is happening in step zero that needs to be passed into step one. And this helps tremendously in reducing the train time. The other aspect where uh, Spark could really help with, uh, along with TensorFlow is with respect to deploying multiple models. So as we train, uh, a model and we have to score large amounts of data. Um, it helps us in distributing the whole uh, workflow. So, and you know, since it's fault tolerant, we don't have to, like, you know, we still have to worry about the failures, but we know when a failure, failure occurs. So, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is a, a, like, you know, the typical architecture. So the one on the left is, say, suppose we are trying to do uh, hyperparameter tuning using cross-validation. So what we can do is using uh, Spark. So if we have TensorFlow configured on a cluster, we can launch a job and ask the cluster to train multiple models in parallel and towards the end select a best model. What I'm representing towards the right is how we can use Spark Magic uh, kernel through a REST interface, Livy, and we uh, connect to a remote, uh, a remote cluster where I've configured TensorFlow on the worker nodes. So, uh, so that's one thing, the TensorFlow binaries need to exist in all the worker nodes and also probably in the master if you're trying to do any uh, computation uh, using uh, TensorFlow library on the master as well. But if not, then the TensorFlow library just needs to be on the, mas on the worker nodes. So how do we, um, so, so the next set of slides, what I'm gonna talk about is how we can use um, uh, Livy and Spark Magic to, uh, to, to, do, to do this um, scalable parameter tuning. Uh, so step one would be to get the client ready and to connect with the Spark cluster. Um, so once the, uh, the, uh, the Livy server is up, one can use the Spark, Ma uh, the Spark Magic kernel, uh, call a command like configure and we can set the parameters that we, um, that we want a cluster. Um, we can basically, we can define the cluster size um, for, our, for our Spark cluster. So in this case, it's uh, like, you know, we want the executor memory to be four gigs and the cores to be, um, to, be, uh, to be four. And also so that everybody's on the same page, when I talk about this executors, just think of it like virtual VMs that we are, we are able to dynamically create. So then, Step two would be to specify some parameters. Like I was mentioning, even when we are doing deep learning, there's like a huge bunch of parameters that we have to control. In this case, since we are doing style transferring, um, a lot of the parameters are associated with respect to weights, uh, number of iterations. As we increase the number of iterations, the loss 
that we're trying to optimize on, that will reduce. Um, and then there are different weights associated to the, uh, the content, that is the input image and the style, and the style image. Um, so, and then, um, then we kind of define some uh, command that we want to use. It, I'm just mentioning here um, as, a, as a command, but it could be a Python function as well, or it, uh, that we, uh, we can attach to uh, an RDD and ask it to compute um, you know, uh, multiple modules in parallel. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what is happening in the next set of steps. I'm just uh, taking that command and then building a collection uh, using these combinations that I have mentioned here, and then creating multiple such commands that I'm, uh, I will use Spark to distribute in parallel in the cluster and ask it to generate multiple images. So with that, uh, uh, let's do a, a quick quiz and see if somebody could help me give an answer to, uh, to this question. So say suppose if I have three sets, uh, A has uh, two values, B has three values, and C has two values as well. As well. So um, can anyone help me answer how many number of combinations, total number of combinations uh, are we looking at? Can we have a raise of hand? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so yeah, I actually have a, a small <laughs> gift for you. So, um, so, as, so that's the right answer. Um, but the most important aspect is that, with, as we see, uh, these are a lot of models. So then there is this other aspect of how do we optimize this hyperparameter tuning, and there are like you know um, multiple ways to do that. Um, I would say that there's something called as uh, random parameter optimizer, random feature, uh, parameter selection uh, that one could use to to further optimize this. But um, details on that maybe for another time. So now getting back to what we were trying to do, we were trying to do uh, parallelize the parameter tuning. So now with Spark. What I'm going to do is um, we created um, you know multiple um, uh, we created like 12 models uh, or model formats or commands. Uh, so now the next next uh, set of task is to distribute or ask Spark to distribute those jobs into the cluster, compute the result, um, and then return the result back. So uh, with the, for this, what I'm trying to do is I'm, um, I'm making use of uh, Sub process from uh, you know it's a Python library, uh, and then launching multiple external jobs into the Spark or Executor environment, running the jobs, and then collecting, waiting for all the jobs to complete asynchronously, and then uh, collecting all the results back. So with this, some like so we wrote like uh, maybe 10 or 15 lines of code. What I've done is with uh, I've uh, quickly taken um, this um, um, uh, computationally expensive. Um, image segmentation algorithm and try to distribute it in parallel uh, and compute multiple uh, models uh, at, in the, at the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I got like a couple of slides. Cool. So, um, so, so what can we use um, a style transfer algorithm for? So like I'm a huge fan of uh, Deadpool and uh, Spider-Man, so I thought that it would be cool to see if uh, Deadpool could be a, a, a friendly neighborhood. Uh, the image is somewhat okay. I uh, couldn't have a lot of control on the weight there, but this one was pretty good. Um, so, uh, so this could be like for sports content generation. Similarly, it could be for branding. Um, and uh, one quick slide here is with respect to computation. So, uh, I still have to experiment with computing a cluster where I could, uh, um, which is basically a a GPU-enabled Spark cluster and see how much performance gain I get. Uh, but even even with simple, uh, like you know, the simple experimentation, um, a single uh, uh, computation was taking me like an hour. And for for 12 models that I created, it took me like nine hours. So there is still some improvement. And this is a very simple cluster. It's like a, a, a one master and one worker node cluster. Uh, so it's not very like you know super fancy cluster that I'm looking at, and that time will reduce uh, as we increase the number of nodes. So sorry, yeah. uh, we need to call. Oh, cool. Okay, we're on our time. Okay, so uh, let's give an applause to Pramit.